let's talk about joy versus happiness. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Brittany Simon. In today's video, before we jump in, I am drinking a tea today from the High Priestess subscription boxes that I used to be sponsored by in the past. Hopefully they'll renew their sponsorship as we move forward into the new year. Um, Beltane tea is the kind we are drinking today. This has organic spearmint, sage, thyme, and rose, red rose petals. I don't know why, but tea, when it has flowers in it, that sounds kind of silly. Tea, when it has like rosebuds in it, always makes me want to drink it more. So that's what we're drinking today. So in today's video, I was inspired to think of the subject matter because of many conversations I've been having. But in particular, I saw a story, a short story, a miss representation of a story from a conservative tweeter. It was a tweet about Jazz Jennings, who's that famous trans child we've been following for over a decade. Uh, Jazz has a very interesting life. She's had a lot of ups and downs, struggles, concerns. But more than anything, Jazz is the sort of experiment for society, for transgender um, reassignment surgery. She is sort of our test for children transitioning young. And that's a lot of pressure to have on you as a person. Recently, Jazz came out in an interview explaining how she felt the struggle because what we are told is that when this happens this is this is actually the apotheosis of individualism this is the apotheosis of human happiness this is what your kids should be taught by the elites in our society so i now want to fast forward this is the season seven trailer for i am jazz so again that was about 2013 that barbara walter special and it featured footage from like 2006 this is now season seven so this is now 2021 here's the season seven trailer this season on I Am Jazz. Two years ago, I was on my way to one of the greatest institutions in the world, but I was actually struggling severely with mental health issues. All right, once it zeroes. I started binge eating and I gained weight and more weight and more weight. And now almost 100 pounds heavier, here I am today. It's a big old belly. Oh my God, <gasps> a side view. I'm out of shape, be easy on me. Having all this extra weight, I can't do so many things with my body that I used to be able to do. Ah! A typical morning's breakfast. Fast food, maybe a donut or two, and then maybe two bagels. Okay, so obviously things are going really well for Jazz Jennings, and obviously more, more clips from the season include Jazz Jennings talking about not feeling good, not feeling like, quote-unquote, herself, not feeling comfortable in, quote-unquote, her body. Here is Jazz Jennings, not, you know, this is, this is, again, from the last season. But we were told that this is, the, this is the perfect path to happiness. It was. This is how happiness was going to be. This is what must be taught to your kids. It must be. And if you object to it, it's because you're a fascist, according to AOC. But you know I can't get out of my head. I know. No, listen. <laughs> it know. just doesn't stop. It's okay. Give me a hug. It's okay. I know what you're going through. We've been there before. No, it still doesn't stop now. I and I'm already going well, back to you, negative. But the more you're talking about yourself, it gets harder. Mm -hmm. You're digging in and you're... It's making you put a magnifying glass on what's already difficult as it is. So this is hard for you, I know. And you don't, we don't want to push and you I know, anymore. I'm the one doing it, like. I know, you're your own worst enemy. I feel kind of all over the place and like my mind is very cluttered and not clear. And I really want to have that clarity. I really want to understand myself and be able to read my own soul and what I want. And it's just very challenging. And I think I'm kind of breaking down a little bit and spiraling into negativity. I just want to feel like myself. This is incredibly like, sad. It. It's incredibly care, sad just. stuff. You know where this incredibly sad stuff came from? Me and I don't feel like what me ever. Me? All I want to feel is like me and happy. This is incredibly sad stuff. And that caused conservatives to sort of imply that being trans itself is the reason she's not joyful. But I think I want to use this as an example to explain to you the differences between being happy and being joyful. It's easy to be happy. Happy is an emotion. Happiness comes from, you know, giving yourself dopamine. It comes from fulfilling something you want. It could be a fleeting emotion, something that happens for a second, something that lasts longer. Happiness is an emotion much like sadness. So having a life in which you're seeking out happiness is a good goal, but is it a permanent goal, right? I think joy is a much better way of framing a long-term goal than happiness because emotions switch. Let's say my, God forbid, my parents die in a horrible car accident. I don't think happiness is the emotion I'd be having in the moment, but I think I could maintain my joy. And this is what I mean. When I think about happiness, I think of it as an emotion. Well, emotions are fleeting. 
So joy is that underlining foundational feeling or state of being you have that allows you to maintain longevity. So though joy can feel like a feeling and be one, and though joy is a state of being, and though the state of being can fluctuate, there's always a foundational way of being. You know when you meet someone and they're super pessimistic and that's just like their foundation? That is something that they could, yes, change. But a lot of us have like these weird foundations inside of us. Maybe it's childhood trauma. Maybe it's just the way we were raised. Maybe it's the way that our brains are. Overall, regardless of why, that foundation is either something that is just who you are, depending on which part of your foundation we're talking about, or it's something you can change. I'm a 20-year-old student. At, I'm doing engineering. Um, and I came in to study, I guess, as with the idea that I want to build products that, you know, have an impact on people that change people's perspective of things and apps that help people. But on a day-to-day basis, I'm on the mindset of the university, which is getting exams done, getting results done. So how do I, don't, how do I stop myself from getting demoralized mm-hmm. on a day-to-day basis while this change happens mm-hmm. for the inertia mm-hmm. of the future? So I make the distinction between joy and happiness. Happiness comes when you win the game, when you get an A on your exam. Happiness comes when your number comes up in the lottery and then it goes away. You know, that feeling. Joy is something more underlying. And you, there, you ask, how do I have happiness on a day-to-day basis? You don't. Um, the things that you will do, you will not necessarily enjoy. But the question is, do you have a sense that they're a part of something bigger? That's where the, that's where the, the value and the joy comes from. You don't have to like every day, but you do get to love every day. You don't like your children every day, but you love your children every day, right? Um, and I think we have this, we've created this unrealist, unrealistic expectation that every day at work has to be amazing. Like every day of your relationship has to be amazing and every day in your friendship has to be amazing. It's, it's just not, it's an unfair standard to put on a human being and it's an unfair standard to put on an organization. Let's say that you want to change your foundation from being somebody who's in flux, maybe high anxiety, maybe... Um, you're frustrated and you need to re reach like reform your perspective, you could start with joy. What is joy? What does it look like? If I was giving advice to Jazz or if I was, you know, talking to her like an old man sitting at a bench at a park, I'd say, young lady, you need to find joy, a consistent state of being that surpasses and is maintained even when you're not happy because happiness is fluid it's fluctuating. So here's Jazz Jennings, this wonderful human who's had a very hard public life since she was a child. And regardless of how you feel about her transition, the transition itself could never have fulfilled her joy because the transition itself was about fulfilling happiness, which is different. In my opinion, anytime we change our outer exterior to fit our interior, we are seeking a happiness in a harmony with ourselves, which is a tool and a stepping stone to lead to joy. But the way that my brain thinks about joy is maybe a little bit too romantic, but it is something that is consistent through the hardships of life. Being in a good mood is really great. And most languages have lots of words to describe the experience, like happy, cheerful, joyful, and so on. The same goes for the languages of the Bible. In ancient biblical Hebrew, there's a variety of words like simcha, sason, or gil. In the Greek New Testament, there's kara, euphersune, or agaliasis. Each word has its own unique nuance, but they all basically refer to the feeling of joy and happiness. The early Christian communities were known for being full of joy, even when they were persecuted. Like when the Apostle Paul was sitting in a dirty Roman prison, he could say that he's chosen joy even if he gets executed. He called this the joy of faith or joy in the Lord. He believed it was the gift of God's spirit, a sign that Jesus' presence is with you, inspiring hope in the midst of hardship. And when you believe that Jesus' love has overcome death itself, joy becomes reasonable in the darkest of circumstances. Now, this doesn't mean that you ignore or suppress your sorrow. That's not healthy or necessary. Paul often expressed his grief about missing loved ones or losing friends or his own freedom. He called it being full of sorrow and yet rejoicing. So somebody who is joyful, I mean truly joyful, I think will feel the very human emotions of sadness and anger and being distraught and all these things but will able to will, would be able to maintain through those moments a sense of foundational joy. So when I read an article or I hear a story or I see conservatives or liberals or whoever twisting a narrative to fit their own bubble, 
I understand the reflex because I understand that I have biases and maybe I'll look at someone and think like, are they happy? People on the internet are always questioning if, questioning if people are happy. But I think the better question is, are you joyful? Because happiness, again, is fleeting. So for Jazz, I would tell her if I sat across from her, again, I would tell her, look, happiness is fleeting. Your trans journey was important to your happiness, your mental health, your well-being. But now you are more than your trans, like your trans identity. You are more than your transition. You are more than this thing that, though a big part of you, is not all of you. Because our gender identities are not who we are. They are part of who we are. They're important. They're key points. They're very, very, like, they need to be validated, need to be encouraged. I think people who seek out a proper gender validation or a gender um, understanding of themselves, they're on the right journey. I just think that it's a part of the journey. And so I want to use jazz as an example of somebody who, of course, seeking happiness didn't fulfill her joy. Because you are so much more than that. You are so much more of a story than that, right? So if you're watching The Hobbit and you're watching Frodo and Sam and you watch Frodo and Sam go through their journey of being happy hobbits at the Shire and everything's great. They have happiness, real happiness, but they also have a sense of joy, but it's not as fulfilled as it could be. You'll notice it's almost like a naive joy. It's like a misunderstanding of the world kind of joy. You could say Mary and Pippin are very joyful. You could say they're happy. But once, you, you know, it's it's kind of easy to be that way if you're growing up as a hobbit at the Shire. But when you really live a life like Jazz has done, or you really live a life like most of us have to do, you are challenged in that happiness to see, is it happiness or joy that you have? So what is well-being? When do you really feel well in your life? When do you truly feel well? When you're very happy, you're well. Even if you're physically ill, you're still well, isn't it? Even if you're medically diagnosed as ill, you're very happy right now, you're feeling well, isn't it? So fundamentally, well-being means a certain level of joyfulness, certain exuberance of life. What is happiness? We can say happiness is this, that, but In terms of life, your life energies are happening in a more exuberant way than it normally happens. Depression means your life energies have become very low and staid. Happiness means your life energies are exuberant. There are many ways of describing happiness, but only those who are happy know what it means to be happy. There is nobody who has not been happy. Everybody has been happy. But the problem is they're not able to maintain it, that's all, isn't it? Everybody's been happy. In the last twenty-four hours, how many moments of joy have you known? One, two, three, how many? Maybe you can count on your fingers, many people have nothing to count. (laughs) When you were five years of age, a child, how many moments of joy did you know in twenty-four hours? Lots of them, isn't it? Somebody had to make you unhappy. (laughs) Now somebody has to make you happy, isn't it? The whole equation has gotten reversed somehow. All this effort of life, everything that you did, education, career, business, family, whatever you did, everything was in pursuit of happiness, is it so? Everything that humanity has done on this planet is in pursuit of happiness, is it so? In the last hundred years, we have done too much on this planet. With the use of science and technology, we have changed the very face of this planet. Today, we have the kind of comforts and conveniences that no other generation could ever even imagine. Yes? What royalty could not afford hundred years ago? Today, average citizens have, isn't it so? Aren't most of you driving chariots with hundred, two hundred horses? Yes? Even kings could not afford this. But are we any happier? We are definitely the most comfortable generation ever on this planet. Is it so, physically? But are we also the most joyful generation? So it's not worked. Science and technology has brought enormous amount of comfort and convenience to our lives. Things that we could not imagine just twenty-five years ago are just a living reality today, isn't it? But are we any more joyful? No. And all these comforts and conveniences have not come easy, they've come at a tremendous cost. 
to every other life on this planet. Yes? Every creature, from plant to animal to everything, including human beings, have paid an enormous price to create these comforts and conveniences and we are not even happy. What is the point? Now, as uh, Frodo and Sam go on their journey, you see Frodo lose joy. You see him become joyless. You see him have moments of happiness, moments of despair, loathing, you know, all these things. And it fluctuates throughout the story depending on where you're at. But Sam, Sam loses it for moments. But Sam, as a foundation, is a joyful person. He's also a wholesome person. And in the face of true great challenge, he maintains that joy, that hope. Now, joy and hope, though similar, are a little bit different. Joy is like a present tense, at least that's how I think about it. And, and hope is a futuristic, it's a what could I look forward to, right? So again, this is just how my brain works. But when I think about joy, I think of it as being consistent. If I think about my favorite Uncle Iroh, happy as can be throughout the whole season of Avatar, except when he's not, which is kind of frequent because emotions change, but pretty happy as a person, right? What I think Uncle Iroh has throughout the series and what he shifts into is permanent joy. He has a sense of joy, a sense of understanding, a real wisdom to him. But once he lets go of Zuko, lets go of the anger and the lack of happiness and reminds himself of his purpose separate from his nephew, he finds what I think is joy. Now, it's a journey. So again, remember, are you thinking of Uncle Iroh, which season? Frodo, which part of Lord of the Rings? Like, remember that these things will shift and they'll differ. So... When I think of jazz and I think of how to explain to people like you need to seek out your joy, what I'm asking them to seek out is a consistency. Now here it goes. I'm going to Brittany at you right now. What does Brittany think is the key to joy? What does Brittany think is the key to joy? Obviously values. The key to joy is values. Values tell you who you are. Values are not things that crumble in the face of danger. They're things that overcome faces of danger. When Sam and Frodo are on the mountain and Frodo is losing his joy and he's given up. Sam's values rise him from the ashes, pull Frodo up, and he ascends, you know, up the mountain. You could say in that moment that Frodo lost his values or maybe never had them in the first place. But Sam, being Sam, always had them. What Sam also had was human emotion and doubt within himself. And this is what I say when I say values. And values look, look d different to everybody. They exhibit themselves differently. But for me, when I think of values, I think of things that I will adhere to even when it's hard. Even when it's hard. So when you ask yourselves, what do you care for more, values or loyalty? That's a great question to ask. Do you want a best friend who will be, you know, val like loyal to you or their values? I would like best friends who are value, like loyal to their values more than to me because I could make a mistake and I'm a human and I'm flawed. And I wouldn't want them to compromise their state of being for an action I did outside of them, right? In those moments in which you see Frodo and Sam together, Sam doesn't need to betray his loyalty to Frodo to fulfill his values. His values of consistency, bravery, friendship, loyalty actually work perfectly with the state of being in which Frodo is exhibiting his behavior. When Frodo is giving up at the bottom of the mountain and he's struggling with that effort to really make it up, Sam in that moment is given an opportunity to also give up, but he doesn't. And I believe that it's because Sam has a foundation of values that eventually leads him to his true joy, right? That full fulfillment of being a person. So again, if you're Frodo and Sam growing up in the Shire with no real temptation from the world to challenge your values, of course it's easy to be happy. Of course it's easy to look joyful. But when you're challenged by the world, and then you still overcome, that's something. My parents growing up in Iraq, I'll tell you, my grandparents, really joyful people. My parents, more happy people than joyful. My parents are still learning how to be joyful. My grandparents, by the time they died, God rest their soul, all four of them, I think they were pretty joyful. I think they finally found a lot of the meaning in their life, even though it happened much later. My grandparents, because of the way they were raised, the trials and tribulations of living in a war-torn country, happiness was sort of a privilege. But joy was sort of a, a mandatory requirement of surviving that scenario in many ways. My auntie in particular, she had a spirit about her before she died, God rest her soul, because of ISIS. She had a spirit about her 
that was really calming and beautiful and like I really admired her since I was a little girl. I have a lot of really fond memories of her, though they're very few and far in between because she lived in Iraq. Um, but when she would visit, I would see her and I was just like in awe of this woman because her energy was just so joyful. I don't know how to explain it to you, but there's like a joyfulness in people that is so beautiful. And I think it really comes from knowing your values and knowing why you do what you do. It doesn't have to be universal values, but joy is universal. Joy ascends bubbles. Joy is not about values in, in terms of shared values. It's about personal values and joy within the self. Now, generally speaking, and you know I hate to do that, I think there is a pattern in behavior in which certain types of ways of existing cannot lead to joy because they are also even without happiness. Not fully, not all the time, but if you look at Andrew Tate, I'm sure he's a very happy person. Totally. Ha uh, Bugattis, pretty women. I mean, even the simple act of masturbation can bring you happiness. But what is happiness in relation to joy? Do I think Andrew Tate is joyful? No. You are watching one of the most popular classes at one of the country's best colleges, Yale University. Our humanity. But here, theology is, uh, professor uh, Miroslav Volf teaches about. students something they rarely learn in school, how to live a meaningful life. When one starts to ask oneself these questions, what matters most? Why do I want this? What should I want? We can get really confused. The goal is not to constantly have to think about what kind of life is worth living. The goal is for that vision of a good life to become one second nature. Now, Wolf and his co-authors are sharing their toolkit for this in the new book, Life Worth Living, A Guide to What Matters Most. You say in the beginning, this book could wreck your life. Is that because you think that for many people, once they ask these questions, all hell's going to break loose. Yeah, they may change, radically change the course of life. He says the first step to finding a life worth living, reassess what you think makes you happy. We want what we see that other people want. Too often, he says, we equate the trivial, like how much money we earn and what things we can buy, with real success. Trouble with money is that pretty soon money morphs from being a means to achieve certain end to being an end in itself. So how does somebody stop on the road to money and go, wait a minute, do I have enough? What is enough? The question can be, be simply, what am I losing by pursuing monetary success? What am I getting and what am I losing? Joyful is a much, it's a very specific concept. And it's, it's very much like an every day is a blessing, every day is a good day. And people have to know that it is something, and you say this, it's something you say this in here, and you say it in the gifts of perfection, that people, you have to work at it. Yeah, I was so off base about this before I did this. I had, you know, oh my God, this is so huge. Like I made a commitment like mm -hmm. to everybody I knew. I said, I will never talk about joy for the rest of my career without talking about gratitude. Because for 12 years of research, yes. I have never interviewed a single person who talks about the capacity to really experience and soften into joy who does not actively practice gratitude. Now, I think I have baby joy. <laughs> I think the last three years have been a challenge to me to seek out joy. And I feel like I'm just in the baby stages of discovering it. I'm about three years in. And so I'm learning to live with being joyful. I haven't been suicidal in three years. I haven't wanted to die. I mean, I joke about it all the time because it's like a, a nice like comfort cope. But the truth is, is that I don't want to die. I'm really happy, but I'm also pretty joyful. It's hard not to be. Even through this like recent diagnosis issues I'm having, all my tests are coming back. And as I'm looking at them and I'm feeling anxiety, I'm also feeling like a sense of relief that I'm finally out of the negative like self-loathing cycle I was in for a few months because it was a lot, right? And now I'm going back and reminding myself that even through that process, now that I've meditated on it and I'm looking at that process I was in, honestly, I did not ever really want to die that whole time. I never reverted back to Manic Brittany. I never reverted back to my old self. I maintained. I just struggled. So for me, that says to me, oh, my joy might have been still there in that foundational sense and I didn't lose it. 
because I never reverted back to a joyless existence. I don't feel empty about life. I feel fulfilled by existence. I'm not fulfilled by happiness, but I am fulfilled by joy because even in moments when I was struggling, I never lost hope. So how does hope tie in? Again, the joy allows for the hope, allows for the continuation. And it's not a hope out of fear. It's a hope out of knowing that it's all okay. So different from my past self. Like my past self, I think would have had a resilience, a determination to hope for a better future without knowing that it's here. But I don't need to hope for a better future because my present is good enough. I don't need to hope for a better future because the joy that I have every day is literally, I've, I've done it, right? Now, again, I'm in the baby steps of joy, which means I'm still learning to live with it in a more consistent manner. Same with wisdom. I don't think I'm a wise person. I think that journey is kind of a long haul journey. It's kind of a journey into understanding like a whole concept of a person and yourself. And I think it comes with the responsibility of being able to face yourself. I would like to face myself. I know I have flaws and I have problems, but I also know that I am so much better than my past self, that I'm in this very foundation sense of self that is probably going to lead me into the next 30 years of my existence or existing rather. So when I think about that, I tie it into this concept that I just recently heard in Verveke's live, uh, or not live stream, sorry, his Meaning Crisis series. Verveke talks about specifically like nihilism and the concept of when we're looking for meaning. I would talk about Nishitani because his book of, of religion and nothingness is an extended philosophically profound examination of this fundamental aspect shift, identity shift. Remember what an aspect shift is. Remember the Necker cube, right? You're looking at something and the thing doesn't change, but the aspect by which you're seeing it uh, changes. It flips. And, uh, and what's salient, what's foreground and background. But this isn't just a shift of aspect. That's why I'm creating this neologism, right? It's an aspect identity shift. What does it mean? You come to see the no-thingness of God. You come to experience it as the inexhaustible creation of meaning. It is an inexhaustible fount of meaning cultivation. It is the ground of meaning. Nishitani thinks the same thing can be found within Buddhism, that when we deeply realize the no-thingness of shunyata, when we participate it, when we identify with it, we gain the competence, the ability to aspect shift the nothingness of meaninglessness so that we come to see it instead as pointing to its ground, which is an inexhaustible source of meaning cultivation that cannot be drained dry by our despair. There is a fecundity at the level of fundamental framing and the way it's coupled to being that cannot be drained dry by despair. When we stop trying to push away the nothingness, but have instead an imaginal relationship to it and move through it anagogically in an imaginal fashion with the nothingness of God, then we overcome meaninglessness. We overcome meaninglessness. Nietzsche bumped up against this, right? He got close to it. If you stare long enough into the abyss, it begins to stare long enough into you. But you know what Nietzsche didn't do? He didn't stare long enough. He didn't look deeply enough. That's Nishitani's critique of Nietzschean nihilism. Right? We go through this moment. Let's say you're having existential dread and you're like, nothing matters. What am I doing here? Are, is there a God? Is, are we evolved animals? What is this? You feel like that lack of happiness, that lack of joy, and you really feel like that burden of why do I know this? Why do I know that none of this matters? And then you hit this nihilism of like nothing matters, nothing matters, nothing matters until you go past it into meaning once again. And that meaning you find again is about you, the existing, not the existence. If you're looking to existence to tell you your purpose, you've lost the plot. Which is why I think a lot of people look to existence like Andrew Tate and say, give me the Bugatti, give me the ladies, give me the money. Because he's looking at existence to make him happy. Which is why he won't ever be joyful. You have to look at yourself and find that meaning within and then 
you can have a symbiotic relationship with existence and existing, i.e. your joy, right? There's so many ways to exist. And you really get to choose unless you are in one of the very rare situations in which you are truly without choice. But the funny thing is that as human beings, most of us really do have the power to be in a position and to change our lives. But it's scary, it's difficult, and you just can't turn left because you want to. You actually, I think, have to need to. In life, we're given challenges, we're faced with controversies, and we're given forks in the road. And every time you do nothing, you're just still looking at those two roads. And you're continuing down this middle path that was never going to lead you to your joy because it's the same toxic cycle you're repeating. If you have an option and you notice a time in your life where the universe is giving you an option, your journey, your God, whatever your like belief system is, you get to make the decision. And those are like missed opportunities, but maybe you just weren't ready to gather the tools to continue on this path of joy. So when you see that fork in the road, you have to really decide, what do I need? And then what do I want? So I need certain foundational things in my life to maintain my joy. I haven't lost my joy in three years. Like I said, I did really struggle through like my recent medical problems, but it never got as bad as I've been before. So that's saying something that tells me, oh, good girl, you've learned. We're still okay, Even though it felt like a step back, girl, it was not a step back. You're doing okay. Look how well you handled it. Look how aware you were. Look how you did this, how you, you know, you have to reassure yourself because you are the only person having a relationship with your journey. Until you share yourself with other people. But what version of yourself are you sharing? How much of yourself are you sharing? To be honest with you, until I got engaged, I never shared all of myself with someone before, ever. And now that I have, it feels like it just makes sense. It's easy. It's healthy. There's, there's so much understanding and compassion and thoughtfulness that I'm realizing the joy that I've created out of this relationship is the continuation of the joy that I started as an individual. Before I was joyful, I couldn't seek out joy. I didn't know how to find it, but I felt like I knew it when I saw it, but I didn't understand it. It was such a far concept from me. I was too busy like wanting to die. I was too busy being depressed. I was too busy being manic for me to realize like joy was attainable. And because my parents couldn't offer me joy because they themselves are still on their own journeys, I could only see happiness from them on occasion when we were happy, which was more than not happy. We were definitely a happy family more than we were an unhappy family. But individual children, 10 kids in a family, means we're all going on individual journeys and not all, none of my siblings have ever been happy all at the same time. And we certainly haven't been all joyful at the same time. We're all working on our personal joys. I think in life we confuse joy with happiness and it stunts our growth. This is my thought. If you don't feel that way, great. But when I see Jazz Jennings and I see the way the world reacts to her and she says, I'm struggling, what people hear is, see, you were never right. But no, I say, Jazz, you are still correct. Stop seeking out happiness alone and let's try to seek out our joy. So much in life is like hard. Life is hard by default. And as somebody who has chronic health issues now and mental health issues, it's not something you get rid of. It's something you learn to live with. And you learn to maintain your joy even so. It doesn't always express itself, but if you know it's there, that's kind of the point. I know I've been joyful for the last three years because even at the height of my sickness, when I was really self-loathing, I didn't revert back to the version of myself that I could have gotten lost lost into, lost. You get what I'm saying? Like there's a version of Brittany out there that I'm really afraid might come back. But I don't think so. I think she's... I think she's okay with the way that things are going, but there is a version of me, right, that could get triggered again for borderline, could go manic again. But I think as long as I maintain my joy, which is a part of my foundation now, I should be good. And that involves my values. Values are things that are stronger than any temptation. They have to be. Because otherwise, are they really values or are they just things you prefer? You know what I'm saying? Um, One of the things I learned from my parents that I saw as a joyful part of their relationship is that they never called each other names. They never belittled each other. And I used to do that with my past partners, like siblings almost like, but this new relationship, mm -mm. we have so much joy in the relationship that belittling each other wouldn't even have a place in it. 
And I learned that from watching my parents. I did. I learned that from watching my parents because, again, even though my parents are still on their individual journey of joy, and joy is very specific, okay, um, that a, a lot of joy is like radical acceptance as well, but on a spectrum. So they mimicked happiness to me and they mimicked joy in parts of their relationship. And I really want to pay attention to that because I want that, right? I need that to feel safe, secure, all those things. So when I look at the, the world and I say, okay, I want to seek out my joy sort of on that spectrum. What does that look like? Well, it looks like radical acceptance on a journey to me, okay? So when I look at the world and I remind myself, I need to be joyful within myself in relation to existing. And then I'm willing to look into existence, you guys, everything outside of myself. And I need to make joy with you guys. That's a little harder. That's a different journey than the internal introspective journey. Introspection inside, extrospection outside. Okay. My introspection is joyful. My extrospection is still on a journey. So when extrospection and introspection collide, when existing and existence collide with me, I have to remind myself, what is the conflict? Is it me or is it me with them? It's usually me with them. It's usually us with them. Jazz is having conflict still within herself. She's not exactly having conflict with existence. She said, as she feels, and I'm paraphrasing here, she's still not quite where she thought she would be after transition, which is normal. Because we are humans, we always think, if I just do this one thing, I'll be happy. I'll be joyful. If I just do this one thing, if I just make a million dollars, if I just get the right surgery, if I just find the right boy to love. If we categorize and separate ourselves into all these beautiful facets of what it is to be a person, I think we'll do a lot better, a better service to ourselves and our people around us in the long run. If you look at yourself and start to tear yourself apart, like if I was working with Jazz again, and again, just like as an old man at a park bench, I'm not trying to speak from a place of like authority. I'm just a person who's figured out a few things about her life and I'm trying to share that joy, okay? If I was working with Joy, I'd say, girl, you've got this. You finally figured out the main key components of your existence. You know your gender, that's great. You know what generally brings you happiness, but let's try to reach for joy. You know that you did the things you needed to do to fulfill certain things, that's great. You have success, you have money, you have a reputation. Let's talk about the things that have nothing to do with anyone else. What do we have left? Well, we have sort of a sense of dysregulation or not harmony within the self. And I truly believe that's because Jazz probably hasn't had the time because she's been so busy since she was a kid. Her parents have literally made her a, a TV star since she was a child. Has this woman even had two seconds to herself? Has she sat down with herself and asked herself, what do I want separate from everyone else? What does Jazz want separate from her fans, separate from her obligation as a trans activist, separate from her parents, separate from even being a woman? What does Jazz want? And that key component, I'm not hearing in her interviews. I'm not sure this girl has had two seconds to herself to ask herself, what do I want? And to be honest, have any of you had that moment? Because I didn't have that moment till I was 20, uh, 28, 29 probably, whenever I was on that road trip in the National Forest. I never had a moment to ask myself, wait, what do I want separate from what the world wants? Because the world is asking so much of jazz right now. If I was her, I'd be so overwhelmed. Think about it. You're jazz. You've been a kid like on TV since you were two, three years old. And the world has told you, you better do this right, jazz. If you're not the perfect trans activist, you're going to get. If you're not the perfect woman, you're going to get. If you're not the perfect. There is a lot of controversy around jazz. And I would never want to be her. And if I'm being honest with you, I don't think I would ever want my child to be put in that situation. So I'm not exactly talking mad on her parents, but like, okay, I wouldn't put my child through that. And now that Jazz is in that situation, it's okay that it is what it is. I want her to have a moment to herself to ask herself, what do you want? It's okay to ditch your activism. It's okay to tell the world to leave me alone. It's okay to give away all your money. It's okay to do anything you want to do in life if it fulfills your joy, like real joy. Not some neurotic obsession you have, not some malicious intent you have, not some selfish desire you have, but a real sense of joy. 
which I think exists in all of us and it is a potential for all of us, but it really is something, and maybe I'm romanticizing it, but I think it is something that is always good. I think real joy is a sense of peace. It's connected to a sense of knowing. And knowing is very difficult. It's why I always say that I think the more introspective you are, the less likely you are to harm people. I think the more you have a relationship with your joy, you are less likely just to hurt people. You're less likely to need to lie or deceive or manipulate. And you're less in survival mode. But right now, when I look at Jazz, I see her as a person who's surviving. She's surviving the media, the pressure from her fans, the pressure from her parents. She's surviving. And I'd really like to live in an existence where I get to see Jazz actually live her life and be joyful. But I just don't think that's going to happen if existence keeps cramming down her throat this idea of happiness she should have. The more conservatives use Jazz as a reason why you shouldn't be trans, the more they are losing the plot of what is joy. And I think that is something that needs to be questioned. I always bring this up, and this is something that, again, I say to my conservative viewers, and let's say you're a religious conservative person, consider that that lifestyle alone has caused the suicide, depression, anxiety, and mental illness in thousands, if not millions of children around the world, myself included. It's not that I'm anti-religion, but how could I not be cynical of religion in the same way you're cynical of being trans? Because when, from your perspective, you're seeing kids being hurt. And from my perspective, I see the same of religion. So the best way I can make peace with that and maintain my joy is to recognize that all of us have the best intentions, but all of us are projecting those best intentions onto each other. And maybe we should just ask the person, what would bring you joy? And maybe we can trust them to know that, or at least learn it over time. And we trust them to make mistakes, and we trust them to double guess themselves. I'm a big proponent of the journey. So I think even people who transition and detransition, that's the right journey for them. Or the people who transition and never detransition, that's the right journey for them. I think you're allowed to have moments in time where you question your gender and wonder if you're a man or a woman. I think it's a good question. It's one that seems obvious, but obviously we live in a world where gods might be real. We live in a world where people believe in magic. We live in a world where we think aliens are real. So is it that far-fetched to consider that gender might be fluid? And if it is for you, if a gender being fluid is too far for you, I would really look inward and ask yourself, well, what do I believe? What am I willing to accept into my reality? And then I would decide how to, again, explain that to the world. Right? Okay. That is my podcast. I hope you guys have a great day. I hope that makes sense. Joy and happiness are different. One is foundational and one is fluid. And I think both should work in harmony. It is okay to be sad. It's okay to have moments of depression. It's okay to want to die. But there's so much to live for. And it starts with you asking yourself, what do I really need? And then what do I really want? Okay, I'll talk to you guys soon. Have the most fantastic day. And yeah, bye. In my head, in real life while I'm dead My belly's being fed and I'm okay I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah Sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Then